Good morning, everybody. Morning. Come on in. Come on in. It's a great day to be in the house of the Lord. We um, have a couple things this morning I'd just like to address. I want to make sure that we're here and that we know that we're here to worship a God of miracles. Amen. I mean, we've seen over the years some pretty dramatic miracles. We've seen a young man, a little baby boy that was born with his organs on the outside of his stomach cavity. We've seen a severely stroked man put back to full recovery. And right now, we have a little one. We have a little maverick that we need to raise up in prayer. Little maverick is one years old, and the doctors discovered this week that he has a hole in his heart. And he's in the hospital right now, battling. We need to raise up Catherine and Matt and keep them in our prayers and prayers for, for baby Maverick because he is going to have open heart surgery probably within the next 24 to 36 hours if he hasn't even started it already. So I want to take a moment and pray for baby Maverick and for Cat and for Matt. Heavenly Father, we are going to sing today your praises because we know who you are and we've seen what you've done and we're asking for a miracle right now in this little innocent's life we know that you can miraculously heal this hole in his heart and that you will just blow the minds of all the doctors so Lord we ask for your divine touch we ask for your divine intervention in the healing of this little innocent's heart. We pray for your comforting hands to be a warm blanket around Cat and Matt as they're watching and praying and they're struggling. <clears throat> be there for them. May they feel you stronger than they've ever felt you before. <laughs> they need you now like they've never needed you before. And so does Maverick. So as the family, we raise them up to you and ask and pray for your divine intervention in their lives. In Christ's name, we give thanks and we pray and look forward to seeing what you're going to do. In Jesus' name. Amen. We do serve a mighty God. So please stand with us now as we go to his throne with our worship and with our praise. Thank you. 
Savior who laid everything on the line for us. For each and every one of us. And we are so grateful. And we're here to praise his name.
morning, beloved. If you got your phones and you want to break them out right now and text uh, your tithes and offerings to the number that you see on the screen, feel free. When you're done with that, would you please put your phone back in your pocket and turn it off so it does not interrupt our pastor during his sermon? That would be muchly appreciated. Um, it's with much joy I get to announce to you today the miracle has happened. We have come into agreement with the landlord with... <clears throat> It was right here at this pulpit that Pastor Rick told you it would take a miracle for us to be able to stay here in this uh, building, and that miracle happened. So, <clears throat> there are conditions, though. <laughs> no, nothing unsurmountable, but we are going to need your uh, cooperation. Um, we had guarantors in our last uh, lease agreement who are no longer at the church, and they guaranteed that we would make those payments, but because they're not here and we don't have their properties to, to guarantee the thing, we had to take on a $50,000 uh, security deposit. And so, yes, so we're calling upon the church, and money has already started flowing in before i even made this announcement so it's not an unreasonable thing i mean the burden's not totally on all of your shoulders uh, it's amazing without even making the announcement how much money has come in but um nevertheless we're asking you to uh if at all possible please support the decision that the elder board made to sign this agreement with the landlord and um, make a donation, whatever whatever you can do, that it would be muchly appreciated. So um, thank you for your support. And um, we'll be here at least another six years and maybe more, but that's what the Lord has done. So thank you. Thank you for your prayers. <clears throat> and so let's, uh, let's pray for today's offering. Heavenly Father, we come, come before you as children of the kingdom, Lord, and we are so grateful. We're so grateful that you bend your ear down to us whenever we come together to pray. And uh, wow, we, we are just overwhelmed with gratitude towards your, your faithfulness to hear our prayers and to bless us abundantly with uh, the ability to be able to stay in this building after all it is your church and so this is your building and we are we are just ever so happy to be here lord and to be able to stay here this is our home and so we thank you father we thank you for multiplying our blessings whenever we give offerings and tithes uh, according to your will you feel fit to uh, multiply them according to our need and so we are so blessed and we are so thankful for father and uh, we come together as Orange Coast Community Church and say thank you in Jesus' precious name. And all God's children said, Amen. 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 Well, I think we can all get on our feet for that, can't we? Yeah.
If you have your Bibles and you'd like to follow along, this morning's reading comes from the book of Mark, chapter 7. The book of Mark, chapter 7, it's the Phoenician woman, Syrophoenician woman. Um, I will be starting in verse 24, and I will read through 29, and then Pastor Dave will pick up on verse 30, and he will read through 34 through 34. Mark 7, starting with verse 24. I'm waiting for everybody to get settled. <laughs> All right. The Syrophoenician woman. Jesus got up and went away from there to the region of Tyre. And when he had entered the house, he wanted no one to know of it. Yet he could not escape notice. But after hearing of him, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately came and fell at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician race. And she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he was saying to her, let the children be satisfied first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered and said to him, yes, Lord, but even the dogs under the table, wait, under the table feed on the children's crumbs and he said to her because of this answer go the demon has gone out of your daughter verses 30 through 34 and going back to her home she found the child lying on the bed the demon having departed and again he went out from the region of Tyre and came through Sidon to the sea of Galilee within the region of the Decropolis and they brought to him one who was deaf and spoke with difficulty, and they entreated him to lay his hand upon him. And they took him inside from the multitude by himself and put his finger into his ears. And after spitting, he touched his tongue with saliva. Looking up to heaven in a deep sigh, he said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. When Mel mentioned about the uh, amount that we have to pay, I heard people gasp, and I gasped originally as well. And uh, I want you to know that in the last few days, before even bringing it to the congregation, we've had three people who have made up more than half of that. Whoa. More than half of that. So we are just thrilled at what God is doing. And uh, if you want to contribute to that, just write on your checks, security deposit fund. And we are confident that fund will be completely taken care of and the rest of the money will be waiting for us at any point in which we leave here. So uh, God is going to be good and take care of us. Let's bow together. Father, we just ask today that you would just watch over our hearts and our lives. Uh, we miss today Daniel, who would always be there in the front row listening uh, drinking it in, but he went to be with you last week, and we're going to be having his service at 1 o'clock uh, on Saturday on the 9th, and that'll be a time for us to celebrate that man's life. So we pray for his mom, his dad. We pray for Wileen and those who, who experience sadness and will over the loss of a good friend, knowing that he's with you, but they need a healing in their hearts, Lord. We, again, as Rocco has mentioned today, pray for little Maverick at the point in which the operation happens. We're unsure at this point, but we're asking that the doctors will make the smartest decision possible. And this little guy, like his name, will be bouncing back with great strength. He has so much joy and happiness. 
And I pray that that will be an aid to his healing. We're going to discover today that you're the God who performs miracles. You step in and do things beyond the pall of our imagination. We've seen you do it in the lives of people. We've seen you do it when we came to this church 16 years ago. We had no idea in the world how we were possibly going to make our payments plus pay off the $250,000 we had borrowed from the congregation. And we paid it off six months early. You've continued to bless us. You will continue to do so. And we will continue to walk by faith and trust you all the way. And so as we step into this passage today, we don't step in with fear or trepidation, but rather with confidence and reassurance, knowing that you're the God who will see us through and the God who in the midst of the healing will teach us some choice lessons about how to approach you and how to wait on you. So our hearts and minds are open. Speak to us today. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Matthew Dawson was hospitalized in Australia with confirmed meningitis. The man was told that he would have to remain under hospital care for three months. But he was abruptly healed at the exact moment his dad on another continent, another continent offered prayers for him. It happened absolutely instantaneously. The director of a clinic for voice and swallowing disorders reports the case of a 52-year-old man who suffered a severe brain stem stroke in the region of the medulla. Strokes in this location irreversibly damaged the ability of the person to swallow. But after intensive prayer, he was instantly healed, and today he swallows normally. He told the startled experts, I know it's a miracle, and it's the only recovery and the clinic director has ever seen in 15 years of his leadership in that place. We serve a miracle-working God, a loving creator who at any point in time could choose to step in and intervene in the affairs of men. He could offer a complete cure from any crisis that plagues them, financial crisis, emotional crisis, or physical crisis. This is the theme of our present series, the incredible compassion of Christ. Say that with me, the incredible compassion of Christ. In today's text, we will encounter two people who are in desperate need of a divine cure. The master will reveal his mercy to them. And in the process, we're going to learn some choice lessons about how we interfere and intervene with God in the whole process of healing in our personal lives. The context for these acts of compassion is revealed in chapter 7 and verse 24. Jesus got up, went away from there to the region of Tyre, and when he entered a home, he wanted no one to know of it, yet he could not escape notice. Have you ever felt like Jesus, pressured by people, pressured by demands, and you want to lock yourself in a room and say, I can't take it anymore? That's exactly how Jesus is feeling right now. He is God, but he's also man, and he's overwhelmed with all the pressure that's surrounding him. There's too much excitement amongst the people. They don't really want a savior. They just want to be healed. There is too much bitterness amongst the Pharisees. They're attacking Christ at every corner. And there's too much dullness amongst the disciples. They're not getting the insights he's trying to teach them. So he figures we need to shut it down for a while. We need to get away from Jewish territory where he's well known. And let's go someplace where people don't know me. Let's go to Tyre. He thinks he'll be safe there. But wherever he goes, people follow after him. Now, the word Tyre refers to a word rock. And it's about 40 miles away from where he once was on the northwest shore of Capernaum. Off its shore lay these two massive boulders or rocks attached by a 3,000-foot ridge, making it one of the great harbors of the ancient world. It'll also interest you to note it was entire where the sailors 
first began to navigate by use of the stars. And so that's where it all started in Tyre. Joshua 19, 28, it tells us that God told the tribe of Asher from Israel to conquer Tyre, make it a Jewish nation. They failed to conquer them. But here's the good news. Where the might of arms was helpless, the conquering love of Christ was victorious. He will come in and change it all around. And in doing so, Jesus today in this passage is fulfilling a 1,000-year-old prophecy. It's found in Psalm 84.4 that one day Tyre will share in the blessings of the Messianic age. When Jesus comes back to establish his kingdom, people in Tyre will know him. And the reason why is because of one lady who exercises extraordinary trust and the tender heart of our Savior. So let's begin by noticing today that Jesus is impressed with a female's faith. I don't know what happened. Could you get me back, please? Thank you. All right, verses 25 to 26. But after hearing of him, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Gentile of the Syrophoenician race. She's a native of Phoenicia, which belonged to the providence of Syria, so she's called Syrophoenician, to distinguish it from the Libyan Phoenicia on the coast of North Africa. The end of verse 26, she kept asking Jesus to cast the demon out of her daughter. Kept asking is a good translation. For Matthew says, she came to him three times. And the first time, Matthew 15, 22, she said, Son of David, have mercy on me. Now, she thought that would be a brilliant way to get in touch with Christ. She's a Gentile, and she's using a Jewish title, thinking since he's a Jew, he will be impressed with that thought. But initially, the Savior ignores her request. For as a Gentile, she has no claim on Jesus as being a son of David. Now, you have to keep in mind, this lady has a bunch of strikes against her. Number one, her nationality is against her. She's a Gentile. Jesus the Messiah is a Jew. Number two, her sex is against her. She's a woman. In that day, sadly, female had very little rights in a Jewish economy. Number three, her, the devil is against her because the demons have dominated the life of her daughter and Satan has taken charge of her daughter's life. Number four, the disciples are against her for in Matthew 15, 23, when she approached Jesus as a Gentile, they said, boot that babe out of here. We don't even want to talk to her. And number five, it appears initially by the words that were read, Jesus is against her. That's not three strikes and you're out. That's five strikes and she's still swinging. That's what makes this woman so incredible. That's what impresses Jesus. It's a remarkable sense of faith, a phenomenal faith in the Father's Son. Notice the shocking words that we see and have been seeing in this series that Jesus surprises us, Jesus shocks us, Jesus keeps us off guard at all times. He has done that in the history of this church, and he does it in our personal lives. It is very shocking and even offensive to see what he says to a woman who is in need in verse 27. He was saying to her, let the children be satisfied first. It's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. What? That would do wonders for your self-image, wouldn't it? To be called a dog. Like the two cows grazing in a the pasture. They noticed a milk truck passing by. On the side of the truck were these words, pasteurized, homogenized, standardized, vitamin A added. 
One cow said to the other, makes you feel sort of inadequate, doesn't it? <laughs> I'm sure she felt extremely inadequate being called a dog. And your question is, why in the world would Jesus call the woman a filthy dog? The answer is, he didn't. First of all, he used a diminutive title. He called her a little dog. Now, dogs in that day were filthy marauders. They scavenged the streets. They traveled in packs. And if they saw a hurting people, a person lying on the side of the road, they would devour them and eat them up. But a little dog refers to the lap dog that was in the home of the wealthy people. So it's not a mean title, but it is a little bit of derisive. Secondly, without a doubt, his voice was non-offensive. You know as well as I do, it's not what you say. It's the way you say it. Ha! You're insane. Or, you're insane. World of difference, isn't there, between the two? And thirdly, Jesus said, let the children be satisfied first. He's not saying there's no room at the table of grace for you. He's saying it has to go to the Jews first. This is a biblical concept. John 1 and verse 11, Jesus came to his own, the Jewish nation, and his own received him not. But to many as who did receive him, the Gentiles, he gave the right to become the sons of God. Paul writes as a Jew in Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of God. It is the power of God for salvation to all who believe, watch this, to the Jew first, also to the Gentile. Paul is a Jewish man, spread Jesus throughout Europe, first to the Jewish synagogues. And the Jews said, we don't want him. So he said, nuts to you. I will give Jesus to the Gentiles. And that's why the Gentile church has overtaken Christianity in the past 2,000 years. When the tribulation begins, there will be a revival on the part of Jewish people, and they will start to understand Jesus is the true Messiah. And that will be altered, not until then. But the standard is, it goes to the Jew first. And so... She's thinking, well, if benefits are in store for Gentiles tomorrow, why not bring them to me today? How about a little sneak preview of what you can do? Make an exception for me. And I want you to know that Jesus loves what this lady does. In fact, I believe it so much so that it's going to impact the way he handles the next case we'll be looking at in our second point. Look at verse 28. She answered and said, Yes, Lord, but even the dogs under the table like the children's crumbs. Don't they? Children love the little dogs because when they don't like their food, they just brush it off the table. And the dog eats it up. The dogs like the kids. The kids like the dogs. And that's essentially what she is saying here. And so she takes a term of reproach and turns it into a brilliant victory. Why? Because she has an excellent attitude, like the three moms bragging about how much their sons love them. One said, my Johnny spends $100 on flowers every month just for me. The second mom said, oh, my Randall, that dear boy, he paid for my trip to Paris last month. The third mom said, that's nothing. My son Harold loves me so much, he pays a psychiatrist $300 a visit, and all he talks about is me. <laughs> yeah, she took the negative, didn't she, and turned it into the positive. And so did this lovely lady. The Savior says, sorry, no din-din for the dogs. And she says, "Ruff." 
I'll take any crumbs that fall from the table. And notice our Lord's reply, verses 29 to 30. He said to her, because of this answer, go. The demon has gone out of your daughter. And going back to her home, she found the child lying on the bed, the demon having left. Mark this. There are only two times in the gospel records, four gospels, only two times where Jesus highlights the remarkable faith of an individual. The first is this lady. And the second is in Matthew 8 and verse 5, the Roman centurion. Both times, they're Gentiles, not Jews. The reason Jesus is so impressed with her faith is the same reason he will be impressed with your faith. God wants your prayers. God wants your desires. God wants your requests to be persistent. Persistent. Ever since we heard the news, where we gonna, are gonna, we going to be here in the next year, six years? We're going to have to leave. I don't know about you, but that became for me almost an hour-by-hour hour request. God, show us. God, show us. I've been praying since the, the time of Easter. And we feel now that God has given us an answer. God is impressed when we continue to approach him again and again and again. He loves resilience. He loves resilience. Do you know today that there are 10 Lego pieces sold for every person on earth every year? That 75 billion of those little plastic bricks that moms and dads tend to step on with their <laughs> open toes as they're lying around the house. Well, if it wasn't for the perseverance of a Danish toy maker, only Kirk Christensen, there would not be any Legos to snap together today. Christensen toiled away in Balloon, Denmark for decades before creating Leggat, from which we get Lego. And my friend back there knows that, from he's there from that area. Leggat means to play well to play well. His workshop was destroyed twice by fire. And then he went bankrupt. And then a world war caused a shortage of materials. But Ole continued to press on year after year. And by the late 1940s, he landed on the idea for self-locking plastic bricks. And by the time Ole Kirk died in 1958, the word Lego had become a household term. Those who persevere receive the prize. Say that with me. Those who persevere receive the prize. Quit coming to church on Sunday. Quit reading your Bible. Quit sharing your faith, and you'll receive nothing. You will get to heaven, and Jesus will say, it's nice to see you. I have nothing for you because you gave nothing to me. So think about that, child of God. Think about that. You must be committed. Amen. You must be dedicated. Grace gets you to heaven. Grace does not give you the rewards. We're told in chapter 19 of the book of Revelation that what we wear is based on how we lived. The robes of righteousness are the righteous acts of the saints. It's not the righteous grace of Christ. So you've got to persevere. You've got to push through. You've got to stay with it. And eventually you get the prize. This lady did, and Jesus was very impressed with her. So Jesus impressed with the female's faith, and now secondly we see... 
that Jesus is innovative with the deaf man's dilemma. Now, here's what I find fascinating. Jesus is going to do something in this next section that he has never done before and will never do again. And when you wonder why does he do something so radical, my thought is this. He's hitchhiking off that lady's creativity. She is so creative in the way that she approached Christ that when Jesus deals with his next issue, he said, I'm going to be creative just like her. I think it's great. I love it. Verse 31. Again, he went out from the region of Tyre and came through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee within the region of the Decapolis. Now, we've seen the Decapolis in our study before. It's the 10 Gentile cities bound together for social and military support. When Jesus healed the man possessed with 6,000 demons, remember that weeks ago? And Mark 5... He said, go to the Decapolis and tell people about the miracle that's happened to you. Now, Jesus, again, is looking for some rest and relaxation. He thinks, I'll go to Decapolis because it'll be quiet. But he didn't realize that the man that he gave the commission to was so successful in sharing about Jesus that the moment he puts his foot on this Gentile territory, Matthew 15, 29 says, the crowds flock to Jesus. So he can't get away from people. Wherever he goes, there they are. And Jesus will minister to them. But Matthew and Mark indicate that he focuses on one man in particular. Tal Bonham writes, Good morning, I said, as I walked from my car to the front steps of the church. You see, I've been invited to the 25th wedding anniversary or the 25th anniversary celebration of a suburban church in Dayton, Ohio. I parked my car and was walking to the front steps of the church. Strange. The man I said good morning to ignored me and didn't even respond. So I tried again. It's a great day, isn't it? They didn't even look at me. They just kept walking towards the car. And I thought, man, have I come to the wrong church? This is so strange. So I cut my hands together and said, it's good to see both of you today. And neither one responded. So he he writes, I stepped into the vestibule, and I saw the pastor and realized it was the right church. He had to be a bulletin that said, welcome to the 25th anniversary of our church and the 24th anniversary of our deaf ministry. Both the men I'd been talking to were deaf. They could not hear. Some time ago was a gift. Ricky and Joanna uh, gave us a... Uh, the series, the series of Frasier, and we watch them religiously every week. And in one of the episodes, he's at his favorite coffee shop at Cafe Nervosa. And all of his family is making fun of Frasier because he did something dumb. And they're laughing at Frasier. And he looks at a coffee table next to him, and he sees two other men laughing. And now he gets angry. He walks over and says, I suppose you think it's real funny to poke your head at other people's business. And they look at him and begin signing. <laughs> They're deaf. They have no idea what's going on. And this man is deaf as well. He can't hear a single thing. Verse 32. So they brought to him one who's deaf, who spoke with difficulty, and they implored him, lay your hands on him. Now, the Greek word for deaf means to be dull. It means that the affected organ has been dulled. It's lost its sensitivity. It's unable to perform the way it should be. According to verse 37, they say that he's dumb as well, meaning he hasn't able to speak. But that's not true. This verse says he can speak, but he speaks with difficulty, and most of us know deaf people, and it makes sense when you can't hear your own voice, it's going to be difficult to speak clearly. The crowds crow, put your hands on him. Why would they say that? Because Jesus has already done it. He did it in chapter 6 and verse 5. 
He'll do it again in chapter 8 and verse 3. He won't do it here. Anyone know why? Because they told him to do it. Tell God to do something your way and go back to this passage and remember, he won't do it. There's a lot of people today angry at God because they're not doing things his way. And they never will do things. He never will do things people's way. He always does it his way. Which is unique, which is radical, which is different, which is out of the ordinary, and which oftentimes will make you feel uncomfortable. I'm not comfortable with putting down a security deposit of this size. But we've been praying, we're convinced this is God's will for us because we've compared it with the other options which could be even scarier than this option. There is no comfortable option for Orange Coast Community Church. And that's okay because we work with the God who works in the realm of the uncomfortable. Amen. You're going to see that in just a moment with this lady. God doesn't take his orders from you and me. You're going to be surprised at the Savior's style. Shocked. In fact, maybe even offended by it. Naaman was offended by God's style. 2 Kings chapter 5. He is the captain of the Syrian army. He's wealthy. He's valiant. He's a warrior. He's well-respected. He has everything going for him, and he also has leprosy. And it's going to take his life. And so someone in Syria says, hey, I heard about a prophet named Elisha in Israel, and he may be able to help you. So with the great entourage, remember this is a big man, he comes to the little quaint village where Elisha is living, and he knocks on the door. Elisha doesn't even answer the door. He sends his lowly servant with a message. The prophet says, uh, go down to the dirty Jordan, dip yourself seven times, and then you'll be clean. And Naaman is furious. How dare he say that to me? Does he know who I am? I'm the captain. I'm the person in charge of the Syrian army. We have cleaner rivers back in Syria. Forget it. I'm not doing it. The servant says, uh, sir, you got leprosy. This is your only shot. So in anger and frustration, he goes down to the water and he dips seven times. And the seventh time he comes up, he's clean. Don't dictate to God what you want. Tell him your basic need. Let him do it his way. I'm going to tell you something. He won't do it your way. There are too many illustrations in Scripture to support what I just said. He's God. Hello. He's sovereign. He does things according to his unique style. Verse 33, Jesus took him aside from the ground, and if this isn't wild, watch this, folks. He took him from the crowd by himself, and he put his fingers into his ears. That's strange. After spitting, he touched his tongue with the saliva. Are you awake? You're looking at it like this is normal. Hey, that's crazy. That's psychotic. Would you like me to spit on my finger and touch your tongue today? This is bizarre. This is berserk. Now, if you're a person who likes to spit, now you've got a biblical justification. If you have a little boy or a teenager in your house who likes to spit, don't show him this passage this will become his favorite verse, and he'll justify it as he spits. <laughs> this is so radical. Verse 34. And looking up to heaven, 
He did it with a deep sigh. There's two reasons why he sighed. He sighed, first of all, because he was frustrated at the lack of faith of people. They just wanted healings. They didn't want a spiritual healing. They just wanted something external, not something internal that would become eternal. But a second reason he sighed is because Jesus never healed anyone half-heartedly. He didn't go around with pixie dust. Presto, healed, healed, healed. He never did that. We discovered weeks ago, he asked the disciples, who touched me? Because he felt purity leaving him. It took something out of Jesus every time he healed someone. Some of you know what that's like. I do. People come to me with crises. Husbands have problems with wives. Wives have problems with husbands. Parents have problems with kids. Kids come to me because they have problems with their parents. People in family situations will come and they're in the brink of divorce when they come to my office. When I spend an hour with them, I'm completely exhausted. I could spend eight hours studying the Bible, preparing for a message, and I walk out invigorated. But if I have three sessions of counseling back to back, I'm ready to crawl in the hole and rest for the next six hours. Jesus was like that. Every time he healed, it took something out of him. And we know that's true because we're told in the great verse of 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your care on him. Why? Because he cures you? No, because he cares for you. Which means if you feel it, he feels it. That's the incredible compassion of Christ. He's never the distant Savior. He's always with you all the way. And so he cares for this lady. He cares for this man. And something goes out of him when he heals them. He said to him, Ephatha in Aramaic, which is be opened. His ears were opened and the impediment of his tongue removed. He began Speaking plainly. Speaking plainly. Reminds me of a so-called faith healer. Put up a tent, had a meeting. Anyone out there tonight need to be healed? If so, tell me your name. One man raised his hand and he said, my, 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 my name is J -J 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 Jim and I have to trouble talking. He said, come on up here, Jim, and stand behind the curtain over here. You're going to be healed tonight. Anyone else? One guy raised his hand and said, my name is Pete, and I've been lame on my left leg since birth, have to use these crutches, can't really walk. He said, hobble up here, Pete. God's going to heal you tonight. And so Pete came up, and Jen came up, and they stood behind the curtain, and the healer went, and he put his hand on the curtain. And then he said, okay, Pete, throw out a crutch. And one crutch came flying out. That he said, now's the real test. Pete, throw out the second crutch. And the second crutch came out, and the crowd went wild. And the healer said, Jim, say something, say something. He said, P -p -p Pete fell down. <laughs> <laughs> when Jesus healed people, he healed them completely. This man spoke plainly. He spoke plainly. He's fully restored. He gave them orders not to tell anyone. Why would Jesus do that? Well, he did that because his enemies are more determined now than ever to end his life. And so he wants to keep his ministry relatively quiet. And the crowds have got to the place as is clear in John chapter 6 with the feeding of the 5,000, that all they want are the miracles. And Jesus is backing off now from the crowds 
because the miracles are called in the Gospel of John, semeon, which is the Greek word for a sign. The purpose of the miracle is not to heal the person. That was never the purpose. That's a nice benefit. But every miracle performed by Jesus is a semeon. It's a sign to point the person to the Savior. And Jesus is trying to get away from the misconception of the crowds that he's not here as a physical healer. He came to be the spiritual healer. Amen. The one who came to die for our sins. The one who came to sacrifice himself for our failures. He came to deal with the sin issue. And that's why he pulls away from the people. He only wants to focus on those who are concerned about having a relationship with him. But the more he ordered them, the more widely they continued to proclaim it. They were utterly astonished, saying, He's done all things well. He makes even the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. He's done all things well. Say that together. He's done all things well. When I read that statement, my mind reels back to the first chapter of the Bible in Genesis 1. After each creative act, God makes the statement in the Hebrew, Tov wa'ov. It is very good. He creates the earth. It is very good. He creates the waters. Very good. He creates the reptiles. Very good. And God pats himself on the back and says, it's good. So child of God, when you do something good, pat yourself on the back. It's not arrogance. It's just recognizing you've done something right. And when God does something right, he applauds himself for it. Very good. Very good. It's not arrogance. It is just acknowledgement of the truth. And the people are saying, look at what he does. Everything he does is so good. And that leads us today to the instructive insights. And here's the first one. God rewards persistent requests. Let's say that together. God rewards persistent requests. In verse 29, the Savior said to the Syrophoenician lady, because of this answer, this answer, I'm delivering your daughter from a demon. Because you refuse to, to say, take no for an answer. I told you no. And you said, I'm not taking no for an answer. I called you a dog, and you said, rough, rough, I don't care, drop the crumbs. <laughs> and Jesus said, I like that. I like that. He likes it when we're persistent, when we come to him again and again and again and again. Resilient. Maybe you offered a request to God. He didn't answer you the way you wanted him to. You walked away in frustration and anger. And you know what he says to you? I guess you didn't want it bad enough, did you? My daughter's car and Laurel were little. We'd go to the store, especially if we, we had made the mistake of going into a place like Toys R Us, you know? Uh. Daddy, I want this, 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 and I didn't pay any attention. Because we get in the car, and five minutes later, they forget all about it. But if they found something they really did want, they keep bringing it up. Hey, Daddy, remember that My Little Pony that I saw? What kind of chores do I have to do around the house to get it? They bring it up again and again and again. And guess what? Daddy will get it for him. Daddy will get it for you when he knows that you really, really want it. Now, he's going to get it in his way, not your way, but he knows your need. He's going to minister your heart in a way that you may not even begin to understand but you have 
to be persistent. You can't give up when it comes to your prayers. You're praying for a son. You're praying for a daughter. You're praying for a relative. You got to keep going and 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 never giving up. This is the style. This is the way Jesus teaches us to pray. When he's talking about prayer in Luke chapter 11, he tells the story of a man who knocks on his friend's door at midnight begging for food because a relative has stopped by for a visit. And in the east, when someone visits, you feed them. That's just the way it is. He has no food. So he knocks on the door and the man says, I'm not going to get up and give you food. I have to disturb the dog. I got to disturb my wife, the kids, all this mess. No. Well, let's see what Jesus says about why this man answers him yes. Read it with me as it pops up. I tell you, even if he will not get up and give him anything just because he's his friend, yet because of his shamelessness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. Focus on ask, seek, and knock. Those are present imperatives. And if you've been with us for any point in time, you've heard me mention the present imperatives. Imperative. The imperative is the command. The present is the present tense. It's always present. It's a consistent command. If you want God to come through, you got to keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking, and then it will be open to you. It's the teaching of Jesus Christ. You got to want it badly. Little girl had a father who was a pastor. And they would play together every night before she went to bed. But one night she had a stomach ache, and mom said, no play tonight, go to bed. And so she went to bed, and about five minutes later, she stumbled to the front of the stairs, said, mommy, I, I really need to see daddy. She said, no, honey, you're not feeling good, go back to bed. Ten minutes later, she came back to the top of the stairs, say, mom, mom, can I just see dad for a second? I said no. Now go back to bed. Ten minutes later, she appeared again at the front of the stairs. Mother, I'm a very sick woman, and I must see my pastor at once. <laughs> I think Daddy showed up. God rewards persistent requests. Here's the second insight. Say that with me. God's actions may differ from your expectations. Huh. Let me give you a verse to tag on with that. Isaiah 55, 9. As the heavens are higher than the earth, what? So are my ways, God said, higher than your ways. Here's what I want you to write down. You can't figure them out. Now, I've been a Christian for 58 years. Take it from me, it doesn't work. I love him more than I've ever loved him after 58 years. But I can't figure him out any more today than I could when I was 12 years old and first came to Christ. And for all the years of study, all the years of Bible college, all the years of seminary, all the sermons, I can't figure God out. He doesn't want me to. That's why he spits on fingers and sticks them on tongues. That's why he does crazy things. Because you serve a radical God. Yes. And you'll never, ever be able to put him in a box. No. No. He could do whatever he wants at any point in time. The Syrophoenician lady thought she had him figured out. He's Jewish. I'll use the Jewish title. Son of David. That'll catch his interest. Jesus said, catch my interest. That'll cause me to walk away from you. I want to heal you, but you got to admit you are as unworthy as a pound puppy. And only then will I step in. The crowds cry, we know the ticket for the cure, Jesus. We've seen the ticket for the cure. Put your hands on him. He said, no. That's not the ticket for the cure. I'm the ticket for the cure. I could put my hands on him. I could speak from a distance. 
I could spit on my finger. I could touch his tongue. I could scratch his nose. I could do anything that I want. And what was true in the first century is true in the 21st century. It's true for you and it's true for me that we can't figure him out. He is sovereign. And he could select any method. He could select any means that makes absolutely no sense to us. Over 30 years ago, I was walking down the stairs of my home. I overheard my ex-wife tell her sister on the phone, I've walked away from Christ, Christianity, the church, and the Bible. I don't want anything to do with that ever again. The problem is Rick is still passionately involved in all that, so I have to end my marriage with him. So I'm going to stay for five more years until I get my education completed, and then I'll divorce him. Now, when I heard that that evening, one thought came to my mind. I'm going to change your mind. This is not going to happen. I spent 60 months passionately praying to God and pleading with her to change your mind and stay in the marriage. In the end, the Lord said, let her go. I have a far finer female in store for you. And now in 2023, I could tell you, I am so glad <laughs> that God's actions trumped my expectations. Amen. Just give it to God and put it in his hands. Watch him work. Let's bow our heads together today. There's something you've been clinging to now as a child of God for some time. It's your relationship with your son or your daughter. It's the issue you have with your spouse. It's the finances. It's something that bugs you about Pastor Rick or the church. I don't know what it is. But there's something going on in your life today. I can guarantee it. And you're clinging to it. And you're disturbed by it. And you already have this expectation of how it's going to turn out. I want you to know it's okay to continually and passionately talk to God about it. But with that persistent plea, child of God, please add this. Oh, by the way, Father, do whatever you want to do. Amen. Yes, Lord. Yes. All of us say that together. Oh, by the way, Father, do whatever you want to do. So right now, in a moment of silence, I want you to talk to God about that particular issue that irritates you. And I want you to place it in his hands. And I want you to tell him, I release my expectation. And I wait patiently for your action. In our college studies, we have been examining the world's religions and cults. And I've discovered that every religion and cult has this in common. Try harder, be better, and maybe you'll get to God. And God said, nope, it'll never work in a zillion years. You got to give it all up. You got to accept the grace 
that comes through my son's sacrifice on the cross for you. Have you done that? Are you willing to give up your way, your expectations, your religious ideas, because they won't get you to heaven? Jesus declared, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father unless he comes through me. And so today, he offers himself to you. But you must make the decision to let go of your expectations and accept his action on Calvary for you. You want to do that. You have never done it before, but you want to do it today. And please raise your hand right now, and I'd love to pray with you to give your life to Christ. If that's where your heart is at today. Father, as human beings, we get frustrated at times because we have expectations of the way we like things to work out, expectations of the church, of our parents, of our friends, expectations of you. And we're let down because things don't happen exactly the way we want them to. We're going to live a far happier and more pleasing life if we just learn to let go. So that's my prayer for your people today and, and my prayer for this pastor. That in the specific areas in which we're still hanging on, still clinging tight, that we will still talk to you, which is great, but we will release the tension by allowing you to do it in your time and your way. We love you, Lord. We're your children. We, as a family, submit to your design for our lives. We offer ourselves fully to you. We do this in Jesus' name. And the people of God said, amen. 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 Our worship team will come up at this time. Well, I believe we've all learned something here today. Lord, help us to apply what Pastor Rick has taught us today from your word. Thank you, Pastor Rick. Thank you. Please stand with us one more time as we go to our Father. He loves to see his children stand and praise him.
working your prayers. 